ya. Um, reality TV uh, is so prevalent nowadays that I just caught my eye last week that ITV have announced that they are planning to launch a channel dedicated to reality TV shows. Does that mean it won't be on any other channel then? <laughs> they don't fall down. That's free! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Our people love reality shows now. Uh, according to The Economist, uh, one out of every seven teenagers <coughs> hopes to attain their fame by appearing on a reality show. Oh. <laughs> There's a full point. Um, and there is no doubt that reality shows are popular. And uh, please understand, they aren't reality. <laughs> um, entertaining, possibly, um, but realistic, not usually. Um, but that doesn't prevent people from thinking that what they see on TV is how the real world, the real world, world is, what I'm trying to say. Um, in the same way that people are often confused about the realities of the Christian faith. People have ideas of what a Christian is, what a Christian believes, the way in which a Christian behaves, uh, what they are like. Um, and not all of those ideas are right. And even inside our churches, up and down the country, we have kind of stereotype ideas of what Christianity is, which again is not always good. What people believe about Christianity is often based on what they think they learned in Sunday school or some RE lesson what they saw on TV, um, what they've been told God is like, or what they've heard that people are supposed to be like in church. But their views of spiritual things are so often closer to reality TV than real people and real life. So James begins his letter that we're looking at this week in James chapter 1 with a kind of a reality check, if you will, for believers. You know, there are two ways that you can look at this world in general. Um, one is through the eyes of unbelief, by kind of thinking, well, the world is just random, it's kind of meaningless, it's, it's chaos, you see all the things that are going on and so on. And the other way to look at the world is through the eyes of faith, that God actually is in control, that he has the power to work things out for good. The first one might seem to appear, appear true. It may appear to be real, but that's not the way the world actually is. And I believe that we live in a world that was created by a loving God. And in spite of our rebellion as human beings, it was redeemed also by a loving God. God is in control. No matter what we think, <coughs> no matter what we, uh, or at least the humans believe to be true, and James wants to make sure his audience, his listeners, understood this. Because they too were going through some tough times. And this letter was written, uh, let's kind of put this in perspective, it was written to uh, Jewish Christians. They had scattered around the Mediterranean area because of persecution that was going on. And they had to, you know, leave their home and so on. It's not that dissimilar to some of the things we've seen in various countries around our world in the last few years, even now in Syria and so on. Christians were being persecuted and pushed out of their homes, and so they left and they scattered around the place. And, and James is writing to this group of people. 
Many Christians were suffering mistreatment at the hands of governments and religious leaders, and James is kind of trying to put their situation into a proper perspective for them. As followers of Jesus Christ, we need to stop and check that we are in line with the Scripture and the teaching of the Lord, rather than what other people think about Christian life and so on, or even what we've been brought up to think about. So there are three reality checks in this first half of chapter one that I want us to just look through for some time this morning. These are things that that first century group of Christians scattered around and even today though need to be aware of three reality checks. And here's the first one. Reality check number one. Courageous. Remember that problems can work for your benefit. Remember that problems can work for your benefit. James begins by making a statement that may not easily be understood at first glance. Because he says uh, in verse 2, Dear brothers, sisters, uh, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity to be joyful. When troubles come your way, see it as an opportunity to be joyful. An opportunity for joy. What does he mean? Uh, he isn't talking about seeing things through rose of other classes. That's not what he's talking about. He isn't talking about, well, pretending things aren't bothering you and kind of putting on a brave face. He's not talking about that either. He's talking about having a realistic, practical, down-to-earth, bottom-line perspective of our problems. Because our problems could actually work in our favour. How, you say? Verse 3 and 4. For when your faith is tested, uh, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. When you are strong in the sorry, uh, so let it grow. When for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. He's saying that when you go through problems, when we go through problems we can become a better person. We can become a stronger person. We can become more capable of doing anything that God has called us to do. There's one view on life that says problems are bad and you should avoid problems at all costs. But James kind of gives us a reality check. He says that actually problems happen. You get struggles in life. And they can work actually for us if you let them work for us. They can benefit our lives if we are willing to kind of tough it out and work it through. And the key principle here is that endurance. An attitude that says, I will not quit through this. No matter how tough the things get, I'm going to get through this. Now every person in this room this morning has problems, has struggles. Every one of them. And you have different ways of dealing with it. Uh, some might kind of, in a certain struggle, go, I'm just going to run home. Can't deal with it, I'm going to shut myself away somewhere. There are others who, when faced with some struggle or difficulty, kind of just end up, as I was talking a little bit earlier about this, just kind of whining and whinging and complaining about it all. Or there's those that, when faced with difficulty, kind of 
stand up tall and write I'm going to work through this. And it's a choice. And if we choose option three, our problems will prove to work to our benefit. With God on our side, we can work it through and the reality of it is, reality check number one, is that we can actually benefit from our struggle. We will gain something from our struggle. Reality check number two. Remember that you're not in this by yourself. Again, there's one view in this world that says you, know, you have to fight your own fights. You have to solve your own problems. You're on your own. You make your own decisions. You have to take care of yourself. The Christian view is different to that. It reminds us that we're not on our own, ever. We're never alone. James says in verse 5, if you need wisdom, if you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask Him. And He will gladly tell you. He will not resent you asking Him. What an incredible promise is tied up in that verse 5. If you need wisdom, God will give it to you. When you think about it, you see that wisdom is really the solution to so many of our problems. Wisdom will not only get us out of the jam, but sometimes wisdom will stop us going into the jam in the first place. I read again this past week of a businessman who was facing a real financial crunch. And he kept trying to go and borrow money from all sorts of sources. And he just couldn't do it. He was really struggling at work. He did, there was real crunch time. And uh, he was trying to gather some money together to keep the business going. And no way was he getting anywhere. He was so desperate. He was getting to the point where he thought, I'm going to have to let my employees go. And he went to God and asked for God. Praise God. And he went to God for wisdom. And one day he says, suddenly the answer came. He thought of somewhere that he could sell off his overstock that he had doing nothing. He compacted his office space down so that he could then sublet some of the rooms that he had in the building. And he put together a fast promotion for his best clients that he'd already had. You see, he thought he needed money. That was his option. Panic, everything's going wrong, I need to gather some cash together to keep the business going. But he asked God for me. And God gave him the wisdom to see it through without any cash in it. And we all need wisdom. You're going to hit some struggle this week. I don't know what it is for you. You may even be struggling today. And you're not alone. And you've got God there who is the source of all wisdom. So instead of going and saying, I'm on this on my own, I need to do this, and what am I going to do? The Lord gives you the wisdom. And James says, if you ask God for wisdom, you'll get it. You know, there'll be times when you think, I need more money, I need more time, I need more resources, I need more people, I need more talent, or whatever it is. But really what you need is wisdom. To see through the struggle. Whatever that struggle is. James writes in verse 9, Christians who are poor should be glad, for God has honoured them. And those who are rich should be glad, for God has humbled them. They will fade away like a flower in the field. 
The hot sun rises and dries up in the grass. The flower withers and its beauty fades away. So also wealthy people will fade away with all their achievements. In other words, again, don't put stock in your own resources. Remember, I can, this is what I've got. This is what I've got to work with. And, and this is, you know, I need to accumulate more or do this with it or whatever. Because James is saying, if you're poor, don't look at your poverty. Look at God who provides for you. You know, we looked at that a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about worrying, I think. If you are rich, don't be too impressed with yourself. You're going to say, oh, wait, I've got all this. Because your money means nothing in eternity. He's saying that whether you have a lot or a little, don't live by your own resources. Don't think this is it, this is, this is me, this is what I've got, this is what I haven't got. Live by God's resources. Because again, as we've said in the last few weeks, you know, the, the things, the tangible things that we've got around us aren't lasting. They aren't eternal. Stuff, money, even friends, you know, they're not going to last forever and ever and ever and ever. God is. And our life is in so don't put all your kind of life into stuff around you, whether it's a little bit or a lot. Yeah. If you need wisdom, ask for it. But when you ask him, verse 6, be sure that you really expect him to answer, for a doubtful mind is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. So just, Lord, I know you've got the answer. You know, you've got the answer to everything. You're the one with all the wisdom. And James always says, if you ask for wisdom, you'll get it. But don't come with your own preconceived ideas of what God's wisdom is going to do. And if you do that, now, great time now. Lord, I want you to answer this for me. I want you to help me in that area. Now, Lord, what is your wisdom in this? I need it in this whole area of this part of my life, this family matter, this. I'm open to whatever you suggest. God is with us when we feel out of time. Okay, last reality check from this this morning. God isn't out to get you. God isn't out to get you. Verse 13, and remember, no one who wants to do wrong should ever say, God is tempting me. God is never tempting to do tempting us to do wrong. And he never sorry, God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else either to do wrong. Temptation is a fact of life. We all have to go through it. You know that even Jesus here on earth in his human form went through it. We're not immune from it. It doesn't just happen to bad people. And it's not God who's bringing this temptation into our lives. Because he wants the best for us. It's not God, why are you doing this to me? He's actually on our side. Do you know who sometimes is the on our side? Time and time again, we are our own worst enemy. Verse 14, temptation comes from the lure of our own desire. These evil desires lead to evil actions, and evil actions lead to death. We don't blame God for our sin. 
Neither can we blame the devil for our sin. Ultimately, I am the one who does the sin. So are you. James uses this word in here, and depending on what version you've got, and depending on what line you're reading and so on, he uses tests and trials, uh, and also temptation. Actually, when you look at the original Greek word that was written there, it's the same word. Tests, trials, temptation. Maybe you think of them as, as struggles to get through. Now, God doesn't send these things our way. He's not, as I say, out to get us. They are part of our human experience. As I say, Jesus went through them himself. These struggles are so often, or at least they should be, a positive side of our life. Verse 12, God blesses the people who patiently endure testing. That word, testing, trial, temptation. Afterward they will receive the crown of life that God has promised for those who love him. Now God doesn't send this stuff to us. But he knows that these things can actually work for our better. We can rely on him more. We can seek his wisdom. We can become stronger and endure and persevere and all those kind of words. You see, these trials and these tests and these temptations all have one thing in common. They are temporary. Again, like we talked in the last few weeks. Those things are temporary as well. And we can outlast them. And when we do, there is a reward waiting for us, says James. God isn't out to hurt us and get us, he's out to actually bless us. So he knows when these struggles come through, he doesn't want us to hurt, he knows that if we have to get through them, we will be blessed by them, we will be encouraged by them, we will be uh, enriched and strengthened by them if we come to him and he sees us through them. We're going to have all sorts of problems and tests and trials and temptations in our life. And the tendency sometimes is to kind of say, what are you doing wrong? But he's not doing it to us. Bad things happen. And we can be negative about life. We can complain about life. We can say, why me, God? All this going wrong in my life. Or we can be positive. This testing time that I'm going through, this struggle, this trial, is temporary. And in this little temporary moment that I'm struggling in, I can actually learn from it and develop in my life. And my character can be built up from it. And I can help somebody else who's going through a similar situation from it. So reality check number three, God isn't out to get us. He's out to bless us. And use even those bad moments to make you and I a better person. So how do you see it? Last half empty, last half empty. Some view Christians as people who don't live in a real world. They are goody goodies who put on kind of rose coloured glasses through life. No. Christians are those who live in a real world. They see the struggles for what they really are. Something that's temporary, that can be endured with God's strength and with his wisdom. And the struggle can be turned into something that will make us better. It's so easy to moan and groan about our pains or our illness. It's easy to criticise someone for winding you up in some way. It's easy to complain about something or someone as if life is not fair. We can all do that. But the true Christ follower 
rises above it. They seek God's wisdom in dealing with it. Lord, how can I turn this scar into a star? What can I learn from this experience? How can I use this unpleasant moment to show your love to other people? And so on. In the last few weeks, as I say, we've covered worry and forgiveness and today's struggles in life. Because they're all part of life. That's why I've concluded them in this first part of the truth. And the Lord has given us answers to all three of those areas. And the bottom line, I guess, that I thought about during the week was don't look down, look up. Because in all of these areas that we've been talking about over the last few weeks, it's very easy to look down, feel bad, feel rotten, feel failures, whatever. And what each of these weeks has kind of hopefully encouraged us to do it is not to look down, but to look up. God is the one who is there to give us strength, to give us wisdom, to give us the power to move forward. And uh, we're going to watch, uh, or we're going to listen and just see the words on the screen. If you know this song, you can join in. But just sit there and have a listen uh, as Don Moen sings, God will make a way. <laughs> 